Our church does uh, a good bit of mission work in Central America, specifically in El Salvador. And our contact on the ground in El Salvador is a guy by the name of uh, Edovigus Nerio Lopez. He actually has like five other names, but that's what he usually goes by. And we all just call him Ed. And Ed has an interesting story. When he was a young man, uh, he fled the fighting because there was a war in El Salvador at this time and left his young wife and infant daughter uh, to, to escape the country. And ultimately, he crossed over into the United States with the help of a coyote. And he had no resources, and to stay one step ahead of immigration, he became involved in a Salvadoran drug cartel. He rose in the ranks until uh, he became second in command. He was ultimately busted in an FBI sting and sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. And he said those early years in prison were absolutely devastating to him. And they destroyed any hope of goodness or dignity that he held on to for his life. He literally felt like his life was over. He didn't even know if he would survive prison, and he was completely broken in every way. A few years into his stint, he was introduced to Christ by a fellow inmate. Not the phony Jesus to fool the parole board, but like the real Jesus who storms our hearts and shakes us until we're empty of all of the darkness and demons of self. The Jesus that, that crashes our hearts and, and breaks us down spiritually and, and puts us back together whole and right. Who gives us new eyes to see the world and a new humility and honesty and gratitude and love. Gone is all of the restlessness and the disillusionment. And there's only a, a now in Jesus that fuels faith and goodness and peace. And, and this is the Jesus that Ed found in prison. He was released early. And although he had the option of staying in the States, he chose to go back to El Salvador to seek his family that he hadn't had any communication with in 15 years and to preach the gospel. He was reunited and reconciled to his wife, which is like a whole other story, and it's incredibly beautiful, but suffice to say that he's reconciled with his family, and he begins to preach. And soon he had his own church, and it was a small church, and he served with distinction, with passion, and, and love, and the church grew and grew, and soon other pastors began to seek Ed out for advice and for counsel. And this continued and, and ultimately grew into the ministry that he has today, where Ed is now the de facto leader of many different pastor groups in El Salvador, and relates directly with pretty much all of the major uh, church groups and denominations, and he is a considerable force in, in that country. He has no title, but works 13, 14, 15 hours a day, often seven days a week, encouraging, equipping, and empowering pastors and church planters. He's the closest thing to the Apostle Paul that I have ever met. And I can't imagine, I, I only wonder at the impact that he has had for the kingdom and that he will continue to have in the hearts and lives of his countrymen. And then I stop and I wonder, where would Ed be without Jesus? Like, where would he be had he never heard the gospel? You see, we worship a redeeming God, a God who is about the business of redemption. For Christianity, at its core, is for the helpless and the hopeless, the beat up, the beat down, the disillusioned and the disgraced, those who are too honest about the world and themselves to whitewash it with wishful thinking and Pollyanna platitudes. And it doesn't necessarily work 
all that well in affluent suburbs like ours unless we alter it to to make it about life enhancement or self-actualization. But those who see the world with eyes wide open and understand how broken the world is and how broken our hearts are, the gospel is a sliver of light in the darkness. It calls into the deep. It calls to our restless and desperate need for wholeness. And it is into this need that Jesus spoke, for example, to a Mary Magdalene or to a Zacchaeus or Nicodemus or the thief on the cross and all of the other liars, cheats, thieves, and, and even whores that found solace in his love. For Jesus didn't come to be tacked on to our already awesome lives. He came to redeem us and to fix the brokenness and to answer our despair. And the question is, you know, what exactly is redemption? What does it mean when we say that he is a redeeming God? Because he has always been about the business of redemption. In Job 19.25, we read, For I know that my Redeemer lives. Psalm 19, 14, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Isaiah 60, 16, I am your redeemer. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse. Well, again, what exactly does that mean? What is the concept of redemption? And it's going to be difficult to explore the entire concept in one message, but there's a text that I would like us to explore this morning, and it's Hebrews Uh, Chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. And I think that perhaps more than any other verse or, or any of the other verses that I considered, it seems to capture the essence of what the Bible talks about when we talk about redemption and the doctrine of redemption. And it reads like this. When Christ came as high priest, he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now the word redemption means to buy back or to ransom. And we see that that word here actually used twice, but in two different forms. We see the word redemption at the beginning of the passage, and we see the word ransom at the the back end of, of the passage. And so, for example, when the students of Highline Grade School in Denver, Colorado, raise money to purchase two Sudanese slaves and then return them to their families, they redeem them. Or if kidnappers take someone and their families pay money to get them back, they ransomed those people. And so the question is, well, in what ways then does God ransom or in what ways does he redeem us? And in verses 12, 14, and 15 of the passage, it says that he redeems us from sin and death. And here's where a lot of people kind of stumble. Because they're offended by the idea that they need redemption. Because Needing redemption means that in some way there's something inherently deficient or there's something kind of wrong with them because, you know, they need God. It insinuates, it implies that we need God. It's the attitude that Paul expressed in in Romans 7, 14 when he says, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And people hear us talking like that and they're like, whoa, 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 back the bus up. 
You know, you can't, you can't talk like that. You can't tell me that I'm, you know, unspiritual. You can't tell me that I'm a, a slave to sin. You can't tell me that I'm in need of God or that I'm going to hell or anything like that. You know, that's just a bunch of fundamentalist BS. That's, you know, uninspired. That's insensitive. It's unenlightened. It's archaic. It's politically incorrect. You know, you can't really, you know, talk like that. And, you know, just because people are offended by that idea doesn't make it any less true. And as long as we hold on to Christianity as life enhancement, we're never going to understand, appreciate, or even be able to embrace, you know, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We're never going to actually be able to embrace the Redeemer. And, you know, uh, as long as it's life enhancement rather than as our only hope of salvation, uh, you know, against sin and death. And so maybe we ought to stop being so pushed out of shape and, and so offended that, that, you know, the Bible implies that we are sinful and in need of a Savior and actually embrace what it is that Christ is offering and give thanks with joy for the salvation that he offers. Because the bottom line is that we do need Jesus. Like, we all need Jesus And any one of us can give a hundred examples of people that we know in real life situations of how much we need Jesus. Like I have a friend in California, a really good friend, helped lead me to the Lord, lost his business because of a cocaine addiction that nobody knew that he had. I had another friend who lost his marriage because of a single indiscretion. Wasn't even sexual. He just did something and that was it. I have another friend who lost his son because he said the wrong thing at the wrong moment. And I'm no different than the rest of them. I'm not. I blow it. I mess up. I sin. And it does dark and terrible things to my soul, which in turn does dark and terrible things to this world. And and worst of all, it separates me from God. And... I can't expect God to to wink at my sin. Like, I can't expect him to abide my sin because I know something about God. I know that that he is holy, which means that he doesn't abide sin. It's, It's inconsistent with his nature. So I know that I am the one who has pulled away from God, that I am the one who has rebelled from God. And that the ultimate expression of this separation that I have created between me and God is spiritual death. Because in God is life. And the ultimate expression of this spiritual death is hell. But I also know that that's not what God desires for us. That's not why he created us. It's not his plan. And so he redeems us. Romans 3.23 All have... have Uh, sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. But then Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness And brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so we see that redemption is all about grace and mercy and forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I need that. Like, I really need that. I need something to cover the darkness in my soul. I need something to repair the brokenness that is in my life that I have created and have to take responsibility for. And so Christ comes and he dies on a cross and just what we we celebrated with these elements this morning, his body is broken, his blood is spilled so that I could be redeemed from sin and death so that I could be reconciled to God. And so we are saved or we are redeemed from sin and death. But we are also redeemed for something. And the text talks about this, and it is that we are redeemed to serve the living God. 
And this is the language of the New Testament. And whenever salvation is talked about, there's often a caveat with that, that, you know, we are saved for good works. We are saved for his purposes. And the word redemption has several different connotations and several different meanings when you break it down etymologically. And so one is to buy back or to ransom, but another one, another meaning of the word redemption is to take something that is not valuable, something that is broken, something that is useless, something that is damaged, and then to, to make it useful and valuable again, like an empty soda can, like it's not worth anything. Usually when I finish drinking a soda, I don't know, I, I just intuitively just kind of crunch it, you know, and kind of squish it, maybe to show off my, my manliness and all my, you know, all my strength or something, but uh, those aluminum cans, you know, it's not really that hard, but, um, but I do it anyway, I don't know, I just subconsciously, I, there's something in me, I have to crush it, and I think that's because it's inherently not valuable at that point. Now that I've gotten the use out of it, uh, there's nothing else to do with it. I mean, I, I guess unless you're one of those people that's spitting cans, and I'm, I'm not one of those people, there's really nothing you can do with that can. But if you take it to the redemption center, they will give you money for the can. And the more cans you bring, the more money you get. And so now it has value uh, beyond its intrinsic value, which is pretty much nothing at that point. Or a coupon. Like if you have a coupon, it's usually some words printed on a piece of paper, and intrinsically, they are worth nothing. There's not a lot you can do with a piece of paper with some words on it. You can throw it away. But if you take it to the right vendor in the right circumstances and you give them that coupon, it can then become very, very valuable. And then you redeem the coupon. Or if God makes something really good happen out of a bad situation. You've, you've been there. When something is just not going well and you're stressed and you know bad things are happening but then somehow some way God does something unexpected and you're astounded and you're like wow God redeemed that situation and so that's kind of what this idea of redemption uh, connotates and and God redeems our lives he takes us when we are broken and damaged and useless and discarded and when we don't even see the value in ourselves and he makes us useful and he makes us valuable again. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Titus 2.14, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And so each one of these passages talk about redemption, and then there's the caveat that it then talks about the purpose of that redemption, that we are redeemed for a purpose. And so we are redeemed from something, and now we are redeemed for something. And a lot of people don't believe it. I mean, they'll assent to it intellectually, like if they read you know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, or something like that, and they'll say, yeah, I mean, I understand that, you know, God redeems me for good works, but in their minds, they don't believe it. And so they never really become who it is that God wants them to be, because they don't see themselves in that way. There's a disconnect in their minds. God is saying that I can be valuable and useful to him, that he's going to give me a whole new purpose, which is to uh, glorify him and to bring, uh, you know, his kingdom to, to the world and, and to share his love and grace and peace and mercy and, and truth and beauty and, and everything with, with the world. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't see it. And there's so many of us who are believers who, who feel like we are inherently unworthy and unqualified to be or to do anything for God. That we're too broken, we're too damaged, we're too messed up. And God just doesn't see it that way. There's an old 
Indian proverb about a man who, who lived in a village by a stream. And every day he would walk down the hill to the stream and he would fill up these two large clay pots. And then he would take a big stick and he would connect the pots and in that way he would carry the pots up to the top of the hill. And one of the pots had a fairly large crack in it. Like you could see through the crack. It was pretty big. And so by the time he got to the top of the hill, that pot was empty like every single time. And yet he continued to do this day after day for as long as anyone could remember. And then one day, that pot with the crack in it was feeling broken and useless. And he asked the man, he said, why do you continue to fill me up when I bring absolutely no value to your family? Every day, by the time you get to the top of the hill, I am empty. And I just can't take it anymore. I just feel so much inferior to my brother over here who does not have any cracks in him. And so the man takes the pot to the top of the hill. And he said, I want you to look down towards the river. He said, what do you see? He said, I see a path. He said, well, what do you see on the path? He said, well, um, on one side, there's a beautiful garden. Flowers and and vegetables and everything, it's, it's awesome. But on the other side, it's kind of plain. He said, that's right. He said, do you know why that garden is there? And the pot said, no. He said, it's there because I use you to water the garden. And so every day when I carry the water, you water the garden, and I have a purpose for you and your brother. And there are different purposes. I use him to bring the water to sustain my family, but I use you to bring beauty into the world. Guys, we don't often understand how God can use us in spite of our brokenness and our cracks and our imperfections, but he does. And we struggle with the idea that God has a purpose for us. And I think one of the disservices that we have done in, 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 in the modern day church to, to our members is we have, in, ha, we, we have interpreted all significant ministry as vocational. And that's a holdover from the days of Constantine in the early 4th century. And somehow we've carried it all this way. That if you're going to do something significant for God, well, then you need to get paid for it. You need to make that your primary thing. And that's never the way it was in the scriptures. And the truth is that we are all ministers and we are all missionaries. And we are ministers and missionaries for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is where God is king and his will is done. And his will is rooted in his character. His will is rooted in his nature. And his nature is goodness and mercy and grace and love and peace and truth and beauty. And every time we bring those things into the world and we glorify God in that way, we are emissaries of the kingdom. And we are doing and being what he wanted us to do. And so if we could somehow change in our minds what it means to, to be of service to God and be useful to God, which is bringing the kingdom to our friends and families and neighbors and co-workers. Maybe we could see, maybe that, that can reconnect in our heads about, you know, I can do this. I can be useful in God's kingdom. And here's the other thing. You think that you don't have it in you to accomplish anything, and the truth is you're absolutely right. But when we yield to God and submit to him, he has this incredible way through his grace of working in and through us. And so it's not even us doing it. It is the Holy Spirit working in and through us that's doing the ministry. And that's one group of people who are not fulfilling the purpose of their salvation or why they are redeemed. We're redeemed again for good works. We are redeemed to serve the living God. And there are some people who don't serve just because they don't think they can, because they don't think they're that spiritual, and, well, man, my pastor's so much more spiritual than him, and we'll just let the professionals do all the real ministry. And then there are other people, honestly, frankly, who just don't serve because they're lazy and because they're self-absorbed, and they'd rather be into all their own things than the things of the kingdom. 
And it's all about what they're going to do this weekend and about what they have and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and God's really kind of, kind of in second place in their lives. And so they just kind of sit back and they watch and they're content to let everybody else do it. And oftentimes these people will, will go to church and they'll support a church that's doing good things so that at least vicariously they are, you know, directly related to where some ministry is happening. And so there's all these people running around in society, Christians running around in society, who have these goals for their lives and their purposes for their lives, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to have a, you know, a really great career and to achieve something great with my career or to have, you know, a great physical body and they're going to work out. And there's all these things that are like first. And there's nothing inherently wrong with necessarily with any of these things. It's just where are they in your life? And what's first in your life? You know, is your purpose to serve the living God, as the text talks about? Is your purpose to do good works that he created in advance for, us, for you to do? You know, is your purpose to be an emissary of the kingdom, to be an ambassador for Christ? Take in the good news of the kingdom of God, taking the good news of the gospel out to those in word and deed who have never heard it. And so I want to challenge you this morning that if you're one of those people and, and for you, you know, you're like, I don't really know that I'm doing that. I don't really know how useful I am in the kingdom. And I think that it's important for us and important for you to look at this from the perspective of eternity. To step back and say, yes, on this side of eternity, we don't really see all the fruit. We don't really see exactly what God is doing in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls. And so it's really kind of hard for me to get into that. But on the back side of eternity, if you can imagine yourself, you know, in eternity looking back on this life and then asking yourself, what did I invest in? What was I about? What was my purpose? And what then is truly significant? You know, is, is, is me being completely ripped you know, should that really have been my highest priority? Or me getting that certain promotion or achieving this level of sales or whatever it happens to be, should that really have been my, my highest goal in life? And I think at that point, there's no other conclusion than we could come to is like, no, I should have invested in that which is truly significant, which is in people. And I should have invested in the kingdom and in bringing glory to God. And when we learn to look at things through that perspective, all of a sudden, our lives take on a whole new meaning and a whole new purpose. And there's a significance there, regardless of who we are and what we do. Like, we could be a student at, like, the state college, and we're like, wow, this is a great mission field. Man, what a purpose I have. What meaning I have. Or, you know, your company, and you're like, man, I'm looking at all of these people in my company, and this is a great mission field. I can love these people. I can serve these people. I can show mercy and grace and forgiveness to these people. I can bring the gospel to them. And everywhere we go, we see ourselves in that light, and all of a sudden there is this sense of significance and purpose that just wasn't there before. And so we're saved from something. We're redeemed from sin and death. But we are also redeemed for a purpose. We are redeemed to serve the living God. But there's one more aspect of redemption that the passage brings out, and it, and it really kind of hints at it, although it's a very strong narrative uh, uh, that all the way through the New Testament. But it's that we're not just redeemed from something, which is sin and death, and redeemed for something to serve the living God, I believe we are also redeemed for eternity. The passage says uh, the promised eternal inheritance. And it is that God desires a people for his, himself. I believe personally that is why God created all of this. I believe that's why he gave us life. I believe that's why we have the lives that we do because he is seeking a people for himself. He is seeking a people who know him and love him and serve and worship him. And if he has to redeem them to do it, then he is going to do it. Revelation chapter 21.3 says, I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 
two things. First of all, eternity is awesome. Like, it's really awesome. There's a story of a wealthy man who was concerned that he was going to leave all of his earthly wealth behind. And he was an OCD type of guy, and it just really bothered him, and he couldn't let it go. And he pestered God day after day, God, please, please allow me to bring some of my treasure into eternity with me. God, it would mean so much. And God got just became tired of listening to him, and the man kind of wore God down a little bit. And God said, okay, I'll allow you to bring some of your treasure into eternity. You can... Uh, bring into eternity as much as you could possibly carry in your pockets. And the man was like, all right. He's, he was really excited. He was giddy. And so uh, he went to his people because he was one of those guys that had people. And, and he uh, explained to them that when he died, that they were to take his pockets and fill them with as much gold as he could possibly carry. And so one day he died, and, and they were good people, so they followed his instructions to the letter, and they filled his pockets with gold. And in this way, he came to the gates of eternity. And when he showed up at the gates of eternity, the gatekeeper saw him coming, this strange-looking guy, because he had these bulges sticking out all in his pockets, and then the gatekeeper remembered, oh, yeah, you're the exception. And so he says to the guy when he gets there, okay, Mr. Exception, let's see what you brought. And so he reaches into his pockets, and he's all proud, and he takes out just handfuls, just overflowing with gold. And the gatekeeper laughs, and he says, pavement? God lets you bring anything you want into heaven, and you bring pavement? <laughs> Guys, the best that we have here, the thing that is the most valuable to us, that is our greatest treasure is the least in heaven. It's commonplace in heaven because that's how incredibly awesome and over the top it is. The second thing is that only the redeemed get to experience it. I want you to imagine that you live in a land where slavery is still a thing. And it knows no bounds, like no gender, racial, uh, national, or socioeconomic bounds. Anyone, anywhere could be taken at any time. And some people don't believe it. They say, ah, it's just a, just a fairy tale, a made-up story to control the masses and to force children to be good. And you're not really sure, but one day you wake up and you find yourself uh, captive, chained with a whole bunch of other people. And you don't really know what happened. Like, you were minding your own business, and the next thing you know, you're in this strange place headed for somewhere else. And you ask one of the other captives, and you say, you know, hey, where is it that we're going? And he describes this awful place where there is nothing but darkness and wailing and weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And he says that it's a place of, of misery and brokenness and bondage and suffering and pain. And you inherently know in your heart that he's telling the truth and your legs just turn to rubber and you swoon. And you wake up and you realize that it was no dream, that it was real. And so as you shuffle along with all the other prisoners going to this terrible place, you notice that there is a man standing above the fray. And his hands and his feet are pierced. And he has authority that you've never seen before in your life. And he's calling out. And he's like, no. No, not that one. Not her right there. She belongs to me. And the guards, like, jump. And they take that woman and they bring her over to the side of the man whose hands and feet are pierced. And then he says, no, not that one, not him. He belongs to me. 
And he goes on this way. Not that one. Not that one. Not her. Not him. That one belongs to me. That one belongs to me. And he's there for a long time, and he's choosing all of those who are his, all of those who belong to him. And when he rounds them all up, he takes them and he brings them home. And home is this incredible place of of wonder and beauty and goodness, the likes of which none of them had ever seen before. And he kneels down and tenderly removes the shackles of everyone. And he says, you were once in bondage, but now you are free. And you're not just free, but you are sons and daughters. And I want you to look around. Everything that you see belongs to me. This is all part of my kingdom And as sons and daughters, this is your inheritance. And it belongs to you as well. Enter into your rest. I know that my Redeemer lives. Because he has rescued me from the dominion of darkness into his glorious light. I know that my Redeemer lives, for he has rescued me from sin and death, and he has given me life. I know that my Redeemer lives because he has taken everything that was broken and damaged and and just empty about my life. And he has covered it, and he has repaired it, and he has made it useful and valuable again. I know that my Redeemer lives because he has taken me out of bondage, and he has given me freedom in Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives because he has changed my entire destiny. From a destiny of hell to a destiny of heaven. Praise God. Praise God. God, that he is our redeemer. 